I felt very honored and pleased when we conceived these sessions, uh, eight sessions all together, on the subject of a life in bhakti. Uh, and uh, as I was thinking about how to conduct this online uh, meeting and online retreat, I felt many, many, many inspirations coming to me. Uh, I think some of you know that I'm uh, used to travel the world over before this uh, change in, in the situation, COVID-19, and uh, give retreats, smaller retreats, large retreats, uh, with only one purpose in mind. That is, how could I lead those who participated in these retreats into a spiritual experience? And we did many things during the retreats which would facilitate that. Uh, and uh, uh, when the invitation came, why don't we make an online retreat of successive uh, sessions which build upon each, each other and which give an experience of bhakti, which bring us to a life in bhakti. Then I thought, what of these experiences from the retreats could go into an online retreat where we are associating with each other through the medium of the computer. Mm. And I uh, had an idea which I would like to share here in this introductory session. It would be my great honor if we could all imagine coming to this session like entering a circle, a circle that is mm, placed all around the globe, uh, where we sit together uh, and we are facing each other and going together into mm, an experience or a journey which alone in our own rooms would not be possible. In order to build this uh, circle, so to say, we will all have to find a place inside from which we can practice our uh, uh, retreat. Uh, and uh, it, will be, it will be that space in which all spiritual experiences are possible. So we can be connected inside through this uh, space which I will try to open for all the participants. I will try <laughs> my best and then uh, yes, uh, there will be something more uh, happening than uh, that is individually possible for each one of us. Now during my presentations I will touch upon things which are known to some of you, uh, but I will touch them differently and hope to open a perspective that is uh, new for you. See, when you came maybe to spiritual life, you might have thought your spiritual development goes something like this. Uh, an upwards leading arrow. I always make more and more uh, uh, advancement. I come to a, all this increasingly higher level of understanding. Uh, and uh, in this way, my life goes on. But uh, as you were advancing, you might have seen that there is a model which is more like a spiral. Mm. In a spiral, you come to always the same point. I will make it here for you. But 
with a wider perspective, with a deepening understanding. So in the beginning, you might have felt, well, I'm, I, there must be more than this physical world. There must be more experiences than the senses of my body can give me. Uh, my identity must lie beyond this body. Then you moved on and you came to another point about identity. You viewed the same point uh, from a wider perspective where you understood I'm also not identical with my mind and the different thoughts which come and go like passing clouds. And as you moved on, you again hit the point of identity. But this time you could under, can understand, well, I'm a specific spiritual individual and it can go on and on and on until you recognize yourself in your, well, Prabhupada says, constitutional position, your eternal unchanging identity, uh, which is full of so much inner knowing. It is eternal, unchanging, and uh, it is full of unlimited oceans of bliss that are inside of you. So yes, the same point in my example, identity, viewed with a different and widening perspective, gives an entirely new and much deeper understanding of what we do. So as I will talk, I will hope to widen your understanding, to bring you higher up in the spiral of your life where you have a broader and more expensive understanding of a spiritual reality. Let me uh, introduce now the new perspective, the higher perspective. There's something I need to just know. Uh, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> um, my technical team here is telling me, do this, do that. <laughs> So um, I could see in my spiritual life that I had remained a little bit on the same level. And I began to under, ask me, uh, myself a question, which became louder and louder as the years progress. How long? Can I go on in my spiritual journey without a deep realization of the things I hear about and aspire for? How can I come to an experience of that I'm an eternal soul, that there is a supreme being, which uh, my tradition calls Krishna, and that we have an ecstatic relationship. How can I go, long can I go on without realizing, feeling, experiencing um, it pulsating through my entire being and, and making a better version of myself? <laughs> that was the question. And it kept on going, coming back. Sometimes it was louder, the question, sometimes softer, more in the background. And uh, then uh, I remember that day, fateful day, I, rem I visited a friend of mine uh, near Hamburg. He is a professor of Indology and he is um, a, a psychotherapeut. Uh, quite well known in Germany and uh, I, I uh, was surprised when I visited his house where he lived with his books. I mean, he has millions of books uh, in his house and one cat called Tiger. <laughs> he said, this tiger can read my books. <laughs> I don't know if it is true. Uh, 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 it was in the night. And being a book lover, I got up and went to the Upanishad section. And there I opened the Chandokya Upanishad 
and found something which totally changed my perspective mm, uh, and answered the question, uh, how can I make deep realization? Uh, the Chandogya Upanishad, you know, they, the Upanishads talk in a very uh, abstract way, spoke about something I would like to read to you. It says, a great treasure lies hidden in your heart. Uh, and it said, you live in a town with nine gates. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and two remaining gates, which no gentleman can refer to. <laughs> they lie under the belt. Uh, <laughs> and in this town of nine gates, is a very special house. Oh, the heart. And again, in that heart house is a very special room. In this room, you, the soul, and the supreme soul live next to each other. In this room, there is eternity. It is very tiny, but uh, it, all the universes can fit millions of time into this space in the, in the, in the house of the heart. So this room has been called in various traditions, uh, the sky of the heart, the lotus of the heart, the sacred space, or in our tradition, the Hridaya Mandire, the temple of the heart. It's the same place. Oh, my spiritual master referred to it as a level, a platform of consciousness, where we would be aware really of our identity and of uh, the Supreme Lord's identity. The Upanishads continue. We walk by this room regularly and are in this way like foolish people who have in their garden a treasure box full of gold, but who go over it without being able to enjoy the treasures. Those of you who have read Chaitanya Charitamrita carefully uh, recognize this image as, you know, when the poor man asked uh, an astrologer after his parents had deceased, I'm so poor, where is, where is wealth? And the astrologer said, the wealth which you need is right under your house. It is very close to you. So I, th I said, well, well, wow. And I remember that night, mm, uh, I was, uh, it seemed I was uh, wakening up. I said, oh yeah, spiritual life is not very far from me. Krishna is not very far from me. They are very close. It's right in the heart. It is waiting to be discovered by me. So as a, because I'm practicing in the tradition of the Gaudiya Vaishnavas, you know, Krishna consciousness, I needed some confirmation in our own tradition, something more so that I would be uh, really inspired and um, to, uh, to do something with this concept. And then I found something in the Bhagavatam, which is an all-important scripture to, to give us guidance. Mm. Vishwana Chakravati Thakur in one purport uh, makes it very clear. You, he says, Krishna, exist with your abode in the temple of the heart. And you can be met 
when the door to the entrance has been unlocked or opened by bhakti. Wow! I put the two things together. There is a spiritual place. It is close. God is not a far God. God is a close God. I am, as a spiritual soul, very close, right where the heart is. It is, from my thinking, only 25 centimeters. Uh, 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 I can, and I can go to this place where, can, where I can meet myself as I really am and uh, Krishna by the process of bhakti. It's the entrance road, so to say. Uh, Srila Prabhupada comments on this important point. He says, all the realizations of Baladev and Krishna and, and, and are possible when one engages fully in the process of bhakti, then the covered core of one's heart is completely open, something open, to receive a realization of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When I shared this with my friends, they said, wow, Maharaj, you really are up to something. You are saying that bhakti properly executed can open a, a spiritual place in which we can see and realize Krishna. But they said, but we are practicing bhakti. We are doing all these things and still we have not realized. I thought this was a good point. And I took this point with me to India. And one morning something, <laughs> as, as it is, Krishna always gives you the right realizations. I was staying in some place and I was awoken by a mm, uh, sound. It's made. Ging ging gong gong ging ging gong 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 ging ging gong gong ging 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 gong gong ging gong. The sounds of an Arctic ceremony, like they do in India, the bells, the bell ceremony, the Arctic ceremony. I rushed out, uh, followed the sound, and came to a place, and was shocked. There was a temple, yes, it was still dark, but the music came from a machine, a so-called Arctic machine. It was a red machine, I knew. It had some metal um, things, and on the metal things there were some gongs, and then it had some hammers, and the hammers were going Ging ging gong gong, ging ging gong gong, ging ging gong gong, ging ging gong gong. I think you got the idea. It was a machine who did the same things which a human being does, but mechanically and not from the space of consciousness which we are talking about when we talk about the sacred space in the heart. You can do many, many years of following automatic mechanical practices with the machine of your body, the hand, uh, the feet, even the brain is only a machine. And because you do it mechanically, you never enter that space of consciousness which a machine can never enter. Uh, and therefore you burn out and you do not feel the living presence uh, of uh, Krishna inside and of your own self. So, uh, let us pause for a moment. Let us think about what we just heard. There's a room 
in our heart. There the Atma and the Lord reside. And once you discover this by the practice of Bhakti, once you go into this room, all the desires of your heart are fulfilled. And you will see the Lord in the innermost core of your heart by realization, not by theory, not through the machine of the body and the brain, but by a conscious feeling, a conscious presence. And then you will be able to say, like Bhakti Charu Maharaj, our dear Maharaj, Thank you for giving me such a blissful, ecstatic life. Mm. So, mm, mm. spiritual life is not about an external change of dress. It's not even about changing the language and not saying hi or hello, but Haribo. <laughs> no, it has to go deeper uh, and uh, has to become a discovery of a state of consciousness, um, not theoretically, but practically, from where the spiritual life becomes a reality. In the nectar of devotion, you will find Prabhupada talking about this with a very illustrative story. He, uh, it's about a brahmana who was not at all well to do. He was very poor and he once came to an assembly of uh, Vaishnavas um, uh, and heard that, yes, you can actually worship and realize Krishna even without any material opulences and material things. You can just see him in the a, 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 a space of the heart. So what he did is he went every morning to a sacred river, practiced the processes of pranayama, and then went into a deep meditation uh, of, uh, uh, where he worshipped the Lord in the temple of the heart. He um, imagined that he was dressing the Lord very nicely in clothing, clothing, ornaments, garments. Uh, he offered obeisances. Then he meditated on cleaning the temple very nicely. Then he took golden and silver jugs and fetched sacred water um, and collected fruits and flowers and then did a gorgeous or impressive deity worship. And then mm, uh, he offered Arctic and uh, so on. Now, he did this many, many years. In his meditation, he also used to cook something. So one day, <laughs> he cooked some sweet rice. Mm, you know, it is uh, mm, milk with uh, rice and, and tons of sugar uh, and uh, he was just carrying it to the um, uh, altar, uh, the preparation, but then his finger slipped <laughs> into the hot pot and he felt so much pain that ah, he took his finger out and the pot fell down and he looked at his finger and it was actually burnt. Now, as this was going on, the Lord in Vaikuntha was sitting there and he started to smile. <laughs> Lakshmi was sitting next to him, said, My Lord, you are smiling? About what are you smiling? <laughs> and he said, You will see later. And he sent immediately his, uh, the Lord sent immediately his dutas, his messengers, who got that fortunate brahmana and brought him right to the side of the Lord who said, I was so happy about your service. 
In other texts it says, I don't care about offerings with gold and diamonds. Uh, I only care about offerings that are done with the uh, uh, um, heart, uh, <laughs> which are done with bhakti. That opens the sacred space. That opens uh, you up for a meeting. And Prabhupada comments, this shows how the Lord is all-pervading. In spite of being locally situated in his abode, although, although the Lord was present in Vaikuntha, he was present also in the heart of the Brahmana when he was meditating on the uh, worshipping process. My point here is we need to learn to do our spiritual practice imbued with a mood of relationship, which a mood of love, with a mood of spiritual presence. And all this is there when you come to that level, uh, whether you show it this way an upward going spiral, or you show it this way, that is a downward leading spiral, which will bring you to this place in the heart where all of a sudden a new perspective opens and a direct perception of uh, uh, the Lord and a direct perception of yourself always. That is called liberation while being in the material world. You are no longer under the control of your mind and the changing thoughts because you have a realization in that spiritual space or on that spiritual level. Mm. Now this may be all very theoretical for you at this moment, so let us now go into the practice. I want to take you now on a journey that leads you inside, down inside the sacred space of your heart. Are you ready to go? Please not. Good, 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 good. Uh, this will mean that some of you have to stop multitasking. <laughs> uh, please put your bags of New York chips to the side <laughs> or whatever distracts you. Uh, you will be asked to meditate and in this way experience this level of consciousness. Uh, ready, <laughs> uh, says someone here on the comment sec section. Mm. Please sit straight. It is uh, perfectly all right if you use a chair mm. or you may sit on the floor. Bring your shoulders a little up and down. You want to open your chest so that your breathing can become deeper. Bring your hands to your knees or your thighs. They can be open. And then feel your back resting against the chair. Or if you sit on the floor, Feel the sensation in your body. If you are ready, please close your eyes. Maybe you hear some sounds in your ears. Just listen. 
to the sounds for a moment. All the sounds that you have heard or hear an experience that you are observing. The sounds may change, but you are the same. Take a free few long breaths. Breathe through your nose, in and out. Maybe you smell something in your nose. All of these things are experiences. They change but you remain the same. Become aware. The entire world in which you exist as a self, whether it is the world around you, your body, or your mind, which also belongs to the world. All of these are experiences that we as the self perceive. Anything that we sense, anything that we feel, anything that we touch, Anything that we think or recall, all these things are experiences and we are simply observing them or witnessing them. And while the objects of your awareness change, we, the self, never change. Now let us go deeper. Bring your awareness to your heart space. In the innermost core of your heart, there's a space where you and the Lord reside. Tell yourself, it is my misfortune that I have been absent from that relationship. And instead, hindering the world and the repeated cycle of birth and death, helplessly, I've identified with one material body after another. But now my fortune has turned. I met Srila Prabhupada through books, through followers, and I've learned from him about my actual identity as pure spirit. I'm a resident of the spiritual world. I'm a soul completely different from the gross and subtle body. Now see the image of the Lord within your heart. Maybe a deity whom you worship, perhaps a picture. 
and meditate on his attractively sweet and gentle smile. See the effulgence radiating from his sweet and gentle smile. And turn to the Lord in prayer. My dear Lord, although I have forgotten you for so many long years in the material world, today I'm surrendering unto you. I'm your sincere and serious servant. Please engage me in your service. Stay in this space. Look at the Lord who is grateful for every service done to him. He carries to his devotees what they lack and maintains what they have. There's no need to be in anxiety. He's ready to give you his full shelter, his full protection. You will stay a little bit more in that space. Gently give yourself time to come out of this space. You might like to rub your palms. Bring them to your eyes as if you do some palming. Then take them away from your eyes and look into your hands and see them as if you're seeing them for the first time. Thank you very much for participating in this. My dear devotees, my dear friends and my dear skeptics, when I discovered this, I bought myself a, a thing like this. We call it in German eine Schatulle. Uh, I don't know how to say it in English. Uh, it's something that opens here. And I put a book together, my own book, where I made notes. This is Shasta. You can't see so well because of the mirroring image. And I took uh, different meditations from Prabhupada, diamond throne meditation, the Brahmanas meditation from nectar of devotion, then different philosophical concepts, weeding in the garden of the heart from Chaitanya Chaitamrita, that we make a heart, the heart a fertile place. You know? um, and I uh, wrote something about the principles 
of this type of life, first and foremost principle is in the degree you try to come close to Krishna, he comes close to you. Ye yatamang prapatyante, no? uh, the divine reciprocation. I wrote about visions, sadhana, practices, and being a very creative person, I made even a, a drawing about my own <laughs> place. That's my temple in the heart. There, there has to be a lake. Uh, it's Radakund, <laughs> Syamakund, <laughs> and I'm in between. And I, and, uh, I put this all in, a, in this way. But I noticed that what I was speaking about is only a level of consciousness, something uh, that uh, brings you deeper uh, inside your awareness and consciousness. And once you are deeper, it's really only about deepening bhakti. Uh, you come in contact with that which is already there. The whole world speaks about transformation, becoming a better version of yourself. And there are many, many mm, mm, good intentioned processes. But in Bhakti, we only speak about discovering what is already there. We are already perfect. We are already transformed. We are already a better version of ourselves. If we can just go a little bit deeper in our Bhakti, uh, uh, come away from the mechanic Arctic machine, ding, ding, dong, dong, ding, ding, dong, dong, where we do everything, but uh, move down uh, uh, in that spiral way and come to the heart. Because Prabhupada says, and that's, that's you see it all over the, uh, the scriptures, in the core of the heart, he uses this example. Uh, there is all the realization is waiting there. You just need to know how to become deeper. And that we will learn by applying these five powerful processes of, uh, of bhakti in a scientific way as the tradition gives us. This is only an introduction, huh? the, the, uh, uh, please, uh, please no. This deepening uh, of our bhakti helps us to find what is already there. Nothing needs to be created. Just imagine this. Hari Prasad, Dayago Ranga, Bal Krishna, Tanu Madhya, mm -hmm. I, this is the people I see, <laughs> you are already perfect. Don't be so much in anxiety, under so much pressure. You just have to know these five processes of bhakti, which will bring you there to your perfection. It's waiting for you. And it's not, not that Krishna waits neutrally and thinks, I hope he doesn't find myself. I'm hiding so well that I hope he doesn't discover me. No! <laughs> he wants more than you want, that you finally make the connection. <laughs> this needs to be understood properly. Um, I had a friend. My friend died from cancer in the stomach. Some of you know him. Uh, Tribhuvanath Prabhu is his name from England. And he used to go in the 80s uh, to Beirut and uh, was there also at the outbreak of the Lebanese war. Mm. He was arrested one time at the border under suspicion of being an, uh, a foreign spy. So, 
he described to me uh, what his experience was when he was made a prisoner. Uh, you will shudder, but you will also rejoice when you hear what he discovered uh, in this situation. I, I will read this to you. He says, I was held for one month in a cell too small to lie, lie down and I was kept under constant surveillance through a grill that was a door to my cell. No privacy, you know, and he couldn't really sleep, you know, when you can't stretch out after a few days, you become restless. Mm. I was fed something that tasted like bread and wa water. Outside the cell, I regularly heard sharp gunshots and occasionally loud screaming, torture and executions. I didn't know what would be my future because my captors spoke a different language. <laughs> no communication, he didn't know anything. In this situation, now listen please carefully. In this situation, all I could do to keep my sanity was to go to that space inside that I heard about in the temple. So I meditated. In my meditation, I visited temples, cooked, offered delicious meals, sang and danced, danced and even gave lectures to huge crowds. After a month, without warning, I was taken out of my cell. I was driven to the airport, unharmed, handed my passport and put on a plane home. Mm. Tribhuvanath told me personally that he felt this one month in this little cell, one meter twenty times one meter twenty, was the best time in his life. Because it was here where he discovered to go deep inside and discover the sacred space in the heart or you could say this level of consciousness, which is not disturbed. Krishna speaks about it as being a flame in a wind still place. No, the flame does not shake. Now our, the flame of our mind shakes a lot, especially in New York. <laughs> I, I know New York. I love New York and I fear New York because it's so, it can be so hectic, but it can be a place of the most amazing opportunities which turn up when you are in your space, when you are in your sacred space. My dear friends, my dear people, what I have discovered is that when you are in that inner space of bhakti, it seems the whole world around you realigns itself and becomes uh, uh, something wonderful where you do not have to do any effort any longer, where you just move into the arrangements that Krishna has made to you. That happens when you first go inside. Have you heard an inside-out approach? That's Krishna consciousness, the inside-out approach. So, uh, I, I'm amazed. I'm, we are in good time. This is uh, revolutionary for Sachinanda Swami. I'm always over time, but uh, maybe uh, today I did some good 
process of bhakti to come to a good place inside and now everything outside works also. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> mm. I want to now leave you with some points. Uh, we have a talented artist here uh, who is listening and this is now the time uh, where you please also listen extremely carefully. Um, how can you apply the knowledge of the sacred space in your daily life? Listen everyone, if you have brought a piece of paper, this is now the time to make notes. Mm, uh, we uh, will, will uh, you will, now comes your takeaways are coming now. <laughs> One moment. Uh, yes. So before any devotional activity, stop. Don't do it immediately. Come to the space inside where you understand I am an eternal soul. And right next to me, in the space of the heart, there is Krishna, or the Lord, Paramatma, waiting to receive my devotional activities and then do it from this perspective. Don't be mechanic, in other words. You sit down and you chant your rounds. One, it takes two seconds. You think, I am really a part of the Lord. And he is there and he will listen to what I do. You would see, you come to another level. Mm. In other words, in one word, because in New York we must be very brief, uh, think about relationship, relationship, sambanda, make the connection, not disconnected life any longer. Huh? Relationship. Mm. The second tip I wish to give you is practice the observer position in your life. In other words, as you go through your life, uh, observe almost like a, a photo camera or a video camera. Uh, the video camera observes without judging, without being disturbed by what it sees. It observes. Bring me the black notebook. Mm. Um, the, and Krishna speaks about this in the Bhagavad Gita. Mm. A person in divine consciousness sees himself hearing, touching, black one, smelling, he observes himself seeing, eating, moving, sleeping, breathing, while all the time thinking, I do nothing. <laughs> I only observe my body uh, acting. You will find this concept in the Bhagavad Gita 5, 8 to 9. Observe. Don't always react. Don't be a play ball, a ping pong ball in, in your busy, hectic New York life or, or any other life, you know. The only way in which you can really understand this is you need to practice. What I did, <laughs> I, I made a post-it. This post-it, I'm sorry, it always changes. You, you see it uh, wrong, isn't it? Wrong side. Or can you see it properly? Oh, you can see it properly. I, proper yeah. I am, I am the soul. 
not the body. <laughs> I, I put this on the, on the mirror where I go in the morning to and brush the teeth. Oops! <laughs> and then I'm thinking, uh, oh, Sachinanda Swami, you look so old. You used to be so beautiful and now you're so ugly. <laughs> and then I see my post-it. Uh, I'm the soul, not the body. Oops! Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, train, train, train the observer position. When there's a challenging situation in your life, step back. And when you see from that position, you see much better much more, and you don't get disturbed. It's called in Sanskrit, Sakshit Vena. Um, my uh, closing remark Mark will be, <clears throat> please don't make what you just heard and what you will hear in the five, uh, it's five, yeah, only five, I made the wrong announcement. There are only five more sessions. Um, don't make it another lecture. In through this ear, out through this ear. And someone asked you, what was the lecture about? Oh yes, it was a German Swami trying to speak English to me, to us. Uh, he made some joke. No, try to go through it uh, and then throughout this coming week practice this one thing which is at the core of this. Enter consciously the relationship and as you enter the divine relationship you will enter the space automatically, the sacred space in the heart. Remember, this is not a distant uh, God, a distant spirituality which happens in 20 or 30 years when you can realize it. No, it's something which is very, very close. And you only have to be willing to uh, enter the relationship. And uh, yes, uh, Try to practice, even try to put post-its, even if your roommates say, well, what's wrong with you? Well, I went to this class, uh, I have to practice now. Next week I will be maybe tested, I don't never know. <laughs> and uh, in this way you uh, can make it something real where a divine reci reciprocation will happen. Good. That is what I wish to bring to your attention today. Uh, I'm now uh, very enthusiastic to hear your uh, questions. We will have about 20 to 25 minutes for this and then Dayal Goranga Prabhu, our host, uh, will make a few uh, closing announcements so that we know uh, how to proceed with this uh, Life and Bhakti course. Is there already a question, Dayal Goranga? Yes, we have multiple questions, Mars, that came in. Um, one of the first ones that came in was from our very own Yashoda Dulal Prabhu. And because he's a co-host for this event, I will actually just allow him the space to ask you directly. The rest of the questions I'll ask on your behalf, but Shoda Dulal, please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, Dayal Thank you, Maharaj. Really wonderful and enlivening. I can't see you. <laughs> we, we are on video. Achy no problem, no problem. Yeah. Maybe, maybe your speaker grid has multiple screens. That's why we might be on another screen, Maharaj. Okay, okay. It, it, just go on and ask. Uh, okay. Yeah, here we can see. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, 
So we have heard these messages before, Maharaj, um, and yet there is a, um, you know, there is a bridge or there is a gap between where we are here and where we want to be on the other side. Is it a lack of complete faith that there actually is a vastly different and blissful life beyond this material world that makes us hold on to our attachments here and not give ourselves fully to that process? And if that is so, how do we realize that, yes, there is actually a spiritual life which is completely different, completely beautiful, and develop that strong faith so we can let go of these attachments and jump to the other side? <laughs> Thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful. I think this question was very pertinent because it's in the mind of many. I would like to say, uh, give two answers. One is um, that it is a commonly misunderstood point that bhakti can only be experienced when I'm free from all attachments. But it is uh, more that if you enter bhakti properly, uh, you will have uh, such nice experiences that you make a higher taste and the uh, old attachments go. And I think we all have made some experiences in bhakti. I remember your very blissful dancing which even gets me up from the sofa <laughs> and uh, where you dance like a child, not like a New York banker, <laughs> but uh, uh, a very joyful personality where, where you have a brief, brief moment of tasting uh, that bhakti. That is my first answer. It is accessible in other words. The second is I would uh, encourage all of you to apply a formula which will 100% give you an experience in bhakti. First of all, uh, you, I call it the 3P formula. The first P is for philosophy. The right philosophy points you in the right direction. Then, the second, people, people who are inspiring, people who are uh, not just inspiring, who are kind-hearted towards you, who wish to help you, uh, uh, and who are a little bit more advanced even so that they can uplift you also beyond your present level. And the third is practice, practice, practice. With these three, philosophy, people, or sadhu sangha, you could also say, and practice, you are bound to make spiritual experiences. And I really wish to say this with some amount of confidence. Why confidence? Well, because I have seen it so many times that I have to believe it is by the right type of practice you will, uh, you will see it. And, and what we will do is in the upcoming session, starting with next Saturday, we will go through the five most powerful practices, but we will always cull some exercise from it where you can feel something and then give you something to do for the week. Something small, which you will like to do. You know, not, oh no, my week is already so full. Please don't give me anything. I'm, um, no, 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 don't worry. I'm also uh, very full with activities. It is, uh, no, no, I respect your time. These three things, philosophy, the right type of people, sadhu sangha, and practice, will bridge the gap between what you know and your experience, between the theory and the realization of it. Yeah, therefore, 
uh, you and Dayaguranga, you wanted something like this, and therefore you coined, uh, coined the excellent title, A Life in Bhakti. No? You want a life, not just a theory in Bhakti. Um, and uh, you can see, Yashoda Dulal, I, uh, I will give you something. No, I don't want to say like this. I wanted to say I give you one million euro if it doesn't work, but uh, I don't have a if I don't have money. <laughs> and uh, and but I'm so sure <laughs> that if I would have, uh, no, we are friends. We will not enter. Who needs money? Only the poor people, you know. Um, and uh, we we will talk about bigger treasures. Yeah, good. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Daya Goranga, what is the next question? Thank you for the beautiful answer, Maharaj. The next question comes, uh, Dear Maharaj, whenever I try to meditate, though I feel the sensation or the vibration, I'm not able to fix myself in that space that you guide us to, the Sri Daya Mandir. All I see is a lot of darkness, and then I get disappointed. I get a lot of anxiety, too. How to overcome this? <laughs> This is a common experience for people who are very much engaged with their mind, uh, who have also many anxieties, that as they enter, they see more darkness, not more light. But it is always said in the spiritual scriptures, the night is darkest before the dawn. In other words, before the breakthrough, you may have to confront some of the uh, inner distractions uh, 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 and so on. But it will not last for long. You may have seen that uh, journey. I see the journey a lot uh, with uh, participants who come to the Japa retreat. Most of the time when I give meditational retreats, those come who want to learn to do good japa, who want to learn to meditate. I don't get accomplished meditators at japa chanters and uh, those who chant their rounds, but I uh, get uh, patients uh, who want to make uh, 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 learn something which they don't know of yet. And I have seen sometimes as they are seriously applying themselves to the technique, uh, there is this uh, point where one sees of faces, maybe for the first time in the life, the inner situation. And um, if it is a situation uh, where we are so occupied, so oh, active, mm, uh, uh, that we have lost ourselves, then we have to go to, through a short moment of uh, going through this. Rumi asked the question, where am I in the thought traffic? So when you start to meditate, it's not that all of a sudden, all the thoughts uh, stop. When you start to do japa or kirtan or any bhakti process, they might become more. But then you will quickly go, you, you will go through it. That work has to be done. And here comes the secret. The sunrise can happen any moment. It's not that you have to go through 20 miles of distraction and, and whatever. By Krishna's mercy, when he sees that you are applying yourself, that you sincerely want, immediate results can be had. Those who lead centers like the Bhakti Center or temples are often surprised when totally new people who come report to them after only an evening of chanting. Wow, I'm, I made a the, the experience of my life. I touched something so deep. 
Mm, why? Why they? And why not you? <laughs> because they applied themselves 100% and there was a 100% reciprocation. Never hesitate to go all the way because the truth anyways lies beyond it. <laughs> and the truth or Krishna can come into your space where you're trying to go in your snail pace or in the pace of an Arabic horse very fast. Both the snail and the Arabic horse will never reach uh, the spiritual uh, dimension on their own steam. No. But Krishna, when he sees a snail is trying its best, he can invade and he can come and take the snail, snail, whereas he does not take the Arabic horse who gallops in pride. I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. Uh, Yes, Dayaguranga. What is the next question? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Sonam, for that beautiful question. Just wanted to thank her. And this next question is coming from um, our dear friends uh, Venkata Bhatta and Prashangi. They're asking, Maharaj, you said that Krishna is eager to be found and wants to be discovered even more than we want to discover him. Why is it so hard for us to believe? Why does it seem sometimes like Krishna is hiding from us so well? Are you ready to listen? It will not be an easy answer for you. It's us who are hiding. It is us who are hesitating. It is us who are keeping a little bit our distance. It is us who are holding on to things which do not satisfy us. Uh, but Krishna is not giving up. Today I heard a very nice analogy of His Holiness Bhakti Charu Maharaj. I, I read it. He says, he said about his, uh, uh, about Srila Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, when you disappeared from this world, I could understand that you are still there calling me. You are like the mother who hides behind the curtain and who calls out to the baby who is there on the floor, come, come, come. And the baby hears the sound and he gets on his feet and he tries to walk in the direction of the sound. And as he walks and matures, he finds the mother. In the same way, you are there behind the curtain and you call us, come, please come. And as we hear it, we may not want to get up, but then we find something in us which says, I am not satisfied like this. And we start to walk and then we discover you behind the curtain. This is a very good image uh, also for Krishna. He is there and his sound, his vani is coming from behind the curtain. Do this, do that. And we hear it, but something in us, an ignorance so old that we can't put a date on it, keeps us hesitating. An ego so 
stiff that it's very easy, very difficult to loosen it up, tells us, no, not yet, not yet. And then uh, it takes a little longer. But I believe sincerely, my dear Venkata Bhattaprabhu, that name I remember, there was a second name, uh, when you are listening to the sound vibration uh, and you follow that sound, you will find the Lord hiding behind the curtain very easily. It, it will, please, I'm making big claims, I know. <laughs> I'm not good in advertising. It's not because I'm from a trained advertisement company. Uh, uh, no, I'm... But I have seen those who visit uh, retreats, various types of retreats, and follow the sound vibration. They discover the hidden uh, Lord. Maya Javani Kachanam Kunti says, you are hiding behind the curtain of the illusory energy. I'm convinced of it. What can I say? I cannot give another answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Diago Ranga is a... Yes, there's still some time. And for more questions? Okay, beautiful. This is a, a very beautiful, heartfelt question from our friends in New Jersey, Akshim Gopika Kanta. They're mentioning that, especially after the loss of His Holiness Bhakti Charu Swami, the fact that many more beloved devotees will be leaving us is weighing on us. As Dry Dwaita Swami put it, it will be a, quote, decade of tears. We know intellectually that Krishna will always provide us what we lack and preserve what we have, but oftentimes Krishna sends us so much love and support through these dear Vaishnavas. How can we build our faith that we will be able to feel Krishna's presence even without the presence of these dear senior devotees, Srila Prabhupada's disciples. Yeah. Although there is a decade of tears and the salt water ocean will increase in volume, Mm. There is something we uh, need to know. I was uh, today giving a little talk to the disciples of Bhakti Charu Maharaj in Australia. And uh, I was reading to them something which Maharaj had written about this point. Uh, great devotees leaving. Maharaj described how when Prabhupada was in his last days, um, he said he had no appetite and he did not wish that any cooking for him would go on. But Bhakti Charu Maharaj faithfully cooked every day a full meal. Then Prabhupada once called him in and said, you know I don't eat. Why are you cooking every day? And then Bhakti Charu Maharaj said, Prabhupada, when you eat just a little and you decide to just eat a little, you will get better. In the hope of this, I'm cooking. And Prabhupada said, I will get better only when I die. Oh. When Bhakti Charu Maharaj heard this, he broke down crying. The next thing he heard was Prabhupada's soothing voice. He said, Is this what you have learned from me? Have I not taught you that the soul is eternal and only the body dies. 
The body has to die. It will die. It is made like this. But the soul will move on. And then Bhakti Charu Maharaj, he understood. Yes, the Prabhupada has just moved on and he is now urging uh, him to grow up uh, by following the voice, the Vani, uh, and then growing muscles to walk. It is said, and we have, ex we have heard this multiple times, that when the spirit of master leaves, he comes back in another form and takes on residence in the heart of a devotee. When Prabhupada was uh, concluding his Chaitanya Chaitamrita translation, he ended everything by saying, I feel never separated from my spiritual master. He is there in the heart. The Lord is also there. And this is exactly what we are trying to, to reach here in, this, uh, in these seminars. Uh, the theory and the practice of entering that heart where true spiritual meetings with the Guru, with, Pra with Prabhupada, with Krishna can take place. Yes. Uh, you know, we, we, we will talk about it, but then we will give you practices and you will see, Dayagoranga will explain in a, a few minutes, uh, uh, there are practices which you can do and that will help you to, to find that space. This is what all of us had to do, the disciples of Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Prabhupada had told us uh, that he would never be separated from us as long as we would follow him. And we had to learn this way of seeing the Lord in the heart. I will end with something very beautiful. Uh, when after a long period of absence, the gopis finally met Krishna in Kurukshetra, they looked very different. Krishna had left Vrindavan. He had left the gopis, his friends, the parents, and gone first to Mathura and then to Dwaraka. And then one day, a letter came from Dwaraka, from Krishna, to the residents of Vrindavan. Come and see me in Kurukshetra. I will, this is only seven, miles away from Vindavan. Uh, there will be many, many people for a grand uh, ceremony and uh, my enemies will not find out that you are very specially related to me because there's so much happening. So you come and we will meet. So from Vindavan a huge procession went, even the old bulls went along <laughs> to meet Krishna. And uh, finally, after Krishna had met uh, his parents and so on, finally, finally, he met the gopis. They were emaciated. Their hair was not kept. Their garments were torn because they missed Krishna so much and they would keep their, bodily, their, their, their bodies only for Krishna's pleasure, not for themselves. So Krishna asked them a question. Listen, beautiful gopis. I appeared in your heart. Why did you feel separated from me? You thought that was not real? He was asking, I appeared in your heart, I was there. You thought this was not real? Uh, so, yes, uh, 
making the heart a place to receive Krishna is the a very important project. It is also there in the Gundicham Marjana Leela. It is a very important project and it means just deepening the bhakti, no? and going uh, there and reaching this place. And yes, but yes, we miss Bhakti Charu Maharaj. Oof. We miss him. We miss him. That is the human side. And we should never stop being humans. But we will meet him on another level. Uh, already it is going on. Many sincere disciples are talking how they are now much more aware of Bhakti Charu Maharaj, much more aware of his instructions, much more aware of his examples. They report that they had almost become a little distant, but now uh, there's so much closeness, but in the heart. And that to discover that level, that is Krishna consciousness. It was a genuine pleasure, really, and I felt, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. I did feel what I requested all of you in the beginning to do, a concentrated circle uh, of uh, people who really want to enter now the deeper dimensions of bhakti. I could feel that, that uh, is a, that's a spiritual energy uh, and uh, when uh, devotees or people connect on the same mission of wavelengths or consciousness, you, you feel the connection, like, like we felt the last few days very much connected all over the world with Bhakti Charu Maharaj, because there was a, a field of consciousness created where we celebrated Maharaj. And then there is a meeting, a joining of forces. So yes, let's keep this up if possible uh, and see you all again. Uh, thank you so much. Hari Bol.